first of all, I'm Julia Lupton. I'm faculty director of Illuminations, and I'm thrilled to be involved with involving faculty as well as guest speakers in cooking and cooking-related educational opportunities through this series. Um, and I'm really happy to meet Katrina Whiteson. Uh, professor Whiteson is an assistant professor of molecular biology and biochemistry in the School of Biological Sciences. And she is also assistant professor of pediatrics in the School of Medicine. And she's associate director of UCI's microbiome initiative. And today's presentation is about how microbiomes can be nurtured in a healthy way by things that you eat. So there will be some science here and some healthy living. And we love that combination in pretty much all of the programming that we do, at least the healthy living part that we do with Chef Jessica Van Roo. Uh, so we're actually gonna start with a cooking demo of Egyptian lentil soup, a favorite recipe. Do you just wanna say a, a word about that, Katrina, before we switch to Jessica? Um, yeah, the that's... recipe and its role in your life and what, why you <laughs> choose it? Well, that's a great question. And I am going to really highlight all the benefits of red lentils um, in this lecture. But um, yeah, I just, I've always loved red lentil soup. I was a graduate student in Chicago and they sold this soup in the basement student run cafeteria. And I used to get it for lunch like many days a week. And it has tons of fiber in it. And it's just incredibly easy to make. I have made this when I'm backpacking with my kids. I've made it like it's just so easy. And that's one reason I really like it is because it's just a way you can get people to increase the fiber in their diet very easily. And it's also just delicious. It's I think it's impossible not to like it, although unfortunately, my kids don't always agree. <laughs> um, so anyhow, and I think it's just so cool that Jess is up for showcasing this. Um, she's fabulous. And I've I always learn from seeing how she cooks. So I'm glad we get to do this. Great. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch to our soup demo and then we'll turn back to Katrina, who will talk to us about microbiomes and you. And then we'll have a final dessert demo and Q&A. And because this is a webinar, you should put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the window. And we'll answer most of those questions at the end, but we may answer questions as they come up as well. So. Uh, this is for you and with you, so enjoy. I'm going to turn it over to Chef Jessica Van Roo, who is an amazing educator and cook. All right, let's get started. So for those who receive the recipe and want to follow along, this is the easiest recipe you'll ever make. And I wanted to keep it simple. This is Katrina's recipe, but um, I want to show you how easy it is to cook without really knowing any knife skills. Knife skills are important in the kitchen, but we sometimes we get turned off when things are too hard. Um, so what we're going to do is we're really just going to, if you have stock or water, that's what you're going to use. And you're going to put three cups if you're using water or four cups if you're using stock. And the reason for this, the recipe calls for um, like, chicken bouillon or uh, vegetable granules, things like that. That's a salt. If you add it too early, you might concentrate the flavor too much and it'll get too salty. So if you're using that bouillon or something like that, just make sure you add it towards the end with one cup of water. So I have chicken stock here. And so I have four cups of it um, and I am going to add them in. So I'll, I already see one question coming up about the health benefits of the different types of lentils. I'm not gonna answer that question, but I am gonna answer this question or not, it's not a question yet. We're using red lentils. Red lentils are probably the easiest to cook. They're the most forgiving in the sense that they cook down to mush. Um, it's really hard to mess up cooking red lentils versus other lentils that like a French beluga that is very round. And it's, it's a lot harder to cook those guys and keep them whole. So I've added my lentils into the water or stock, and then I'm gonna add a carrot, a tomato, and some onion too, and garlic. So like I was saying, no knife skills, completely okay. Take your carrot and grate it. 
This also speeds up the cooking process then. Because if you think about it, the only thing in here that's really hard would be the carrot. And so if you wanna cook that down, grate it, and you'll get a lot more. It'll cook a lot faster. The other thing is, if you notice, I didn't peel it. This is an organic carrot. So use the peel, because it has a lot of the nutrients on the outside. I also purposely brought a carrot with a carrot top. Because if you like fine carrots with carrot tops, make sure you take the carrot tops off immediately when you get home, because it'll start drawing some of the nutrients into the carrot tops. In other words, don't throw away your carrot tops. You can make anything that you would normally put parsley in or basil. So you can make a chimichurri, you can make um, a pesto. You can just saute it with other greens. They're really good. It's light. It's not very carroty. It's more like a beet green. So if you like beet greens, similar. So I'm going to add that in. Aroma tomato. So for the Roma tomato, you do need a cut, but it, you don't need to dice it or anything. You just want to cut it in half and quarter it. And you can cut it up even more if you want, just so it speeds up the cooking process. Now, if you don't have a fresh tomato, it's completely fine. You can use canned tomatoes. Half of a can would be plenty. And then onion. You only want a small onion. So I'm only gonna use half of this. So this is probably gonna be the hardest thing to cut if you don't normally chop or cut things. So get ready. When you hold a knife, you wanna pinch the blade and then put your fingers around the outside. If something rolls around, try to keep your hand on the outside of it to stabilize it and then put your knife in between and then cut. And then peel. So I'm not gonna dice this. I'm just gonna roughly chop it. I'm gonna take off one end, take off the other end. And chop and put that in. Garlic. I love giving garlic tricks. This is the new one, mason jars. We all have mason jars around, I feel like. A lot of people bought a lot of mason jars this season. So <laughs> if you want, grab a mason jar. This does take a lot of effort. So it's not as easy as it seems. And I'm weak these days. I have not worked out like I should. So give it a good shake. And it'll start breaking up all the cloves for you. And you can go in and it's already started to do the peeling for you. And you can just peel the rest off just like that. And we're just gonna not even dice them, just quarter them and add them in as well. So I'll add one more. Or you can use regular granulated garlic. If you want just how to, how to chop a regular clove or how to peel a regular clove, use the heel of your knife and the heel of your hand and just push down and crunch it, crunch it out. And then you've got your garlic clove there as well. So those are the ingredients that go in. I'm gonna add some seasoning now. So we're gonna add coriander and cumin. Two spices that make this soup, that special, it gives it that special flavor. I feel like you can never have too much cumin in the house. So cumin, I actually do buy ground most of the time. But if you want, um, if you don't feel like you use it that much, buy the seeds and grind it as you need in a coffee grinder. Coffee grinders are great for this. And to tell you the truth, if I were making this at home, I would even throw in the carrot tops just because everything gets blended in anyways. And so it'll all taste good. Now I'm gonna go over to the stove and I am going to start it. Hold on, I'm gonna just show you, there we go. All right, so if you wanted to kick this soup up a notch though, what you could do is dice and saute the onions and the garlic and then create kind of layers of flavor for that. So I'm just gonna quickly show you how you dice an onion 
And then I'm gonna show you how you would sweat it to build that flavor. If you like the flavor of garlic, don't add it into the hot oil. Create layers of it. If you really, really, really like the flavor of garlic, I know people that will add it in at the very last second of cooking and then finish off the dish. And that gives you that really, really pungent taste. But that's only if you want it. Um, we're going to come back here. I'm going to show you how to dice this other half of the onion just so that you have a little bit of knife skills. So we're going to peel it. And that whole end is intact and it's holding everything together. So I'm just going to trim this other end off. And then using the tip of my knife, I'm going to cut down. And then if you dare, and if your knife is sharp enough, you can saw through and then to dice it, hold everything together and dice. And if you're new to knife skills, my knife is not sharp, sorry. Um, if you're new to knife skills, what I can tell you is practice with an onion and always cut one more. Onions are the hardest to get used to cutting. And so if you can try practicing and just store your onions, use them when, use them in a salad, use them as a base for something. But if you cut one more, you'll get more into the habit of dicing and chopping your own veggies. So for the garlic, I'm just gonna do one just so that I can show you how to sweat it out. And just to let you know, I don't think you can see. But if you ever find a sprout inside your garlic, that sprout has a lot of that garlic flavor. It's the intense kind of like in your face pungent. So if you're afraid of that strong garlic pungent taste, take out that, you can take it out. What that means though, is that the garlic itself is sweeter. It's not as pungent as most fresh garlic is. And so it's up to you how you wanna use it, but it's, it, people have asked whether or not to throw garlic that's sprouted away and you don't need to. It's just more intense of a flavor when you hit that kind of sprout area. All right, so to sweat. I'm going to... So hopefully, maybe some of you are making this with me. Sorry if I go a little too fast. I have a tendency to do that. <laughs> when I teach the med students, when we do culinary medicine, that's the number one complaint I get. So when you do it this way, you are gonna add a little oil. So wait for the pan to get hot or the pot and then coat with enough oil just so that it coats the bottom. It's very hard for chefs and recipe writers to tell you how much oil because it depends on the vessel that you're using. So just enough to coat the bottom of the pan. And then I'm gonna add my onions first. And I wanna hear that sizzle. And that onion and the heat will start drawing out the sugars from the onion, giving it that little bit of sweetness into your food. And so once the onions have sauteed a bit, then I would add my garlic. And continue on with the recipe. And there's a couple of questions here for you, Jess. Sweet. Let's see. Uh, Deborah Glazer asks about storing the unused half of the onion. Ooh, in Tupperware, a Ziploc bag. I'll be honest, if you put it, in, I would do both. I put it in a Ziploc bag, then in the Tupperware. The onions do stink up your refrigerators a lot. Um, so you do want to, if you're afraid of that smell, do both. But if not, the Ziploc bags are perfectly fine. And then another question here has to do with that cutting surface that you're using. What kind of mat I'm, is that? I'm using one of those flexible mats. And I like it because I can then take my produce or whatever I'm chopping, fold it up and then pour it. The wooden ones are great for things. Um, wooden mat, wooden cutting boards are great, especially for your knife. 
But for transporting ingredients, this always tends to be easier. So if you have a very good knife, use it on a regular wooden cutting board. It'll make it, it, your knife will last a lot longer. This will not damage your knife, but it won't keep it as sharp for as long. Ooh. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna let that simmer now. And since we're talking about freezer, this soup freezes incredibly well. We tried to do this class last year, literally the day of the, I think the day before the pandemic hit. And I had all the ingredients ready to go. And we were still allowed to come into work, I think. Um, and so what happened was I made this huge vat of this soup and everyone got like a pandemic kit of lentil soup that was frozen in Ziploc bags and you freeze them, I freeze them flat. So you fill it in a Ziploc bag, freeze it flat. And then I sauteed all the vegetables we had for a salad and had a big stir fry and then made everyone energy balls. And so I started the pandemic, I started everyone's pandemic with lentil soup and energy balls. So it, it's been a long time since I've wanted to do this event. And so it's just, it's a pleasure to work with Katrina and everything that she does. And I'm sure she has a wealth of information and I'm sure you all have a million questions like I always do. So I'm gonna hand it over to her um, and I'll show you the soup when she's done. Thank you, Jess. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so I'm Katrina Whiteson and I'm really excited to tell you about why I think fiber is an important way to promote your health and your microbiome. Um, so here, I'm just gonna share some slides, give me a second. Um, so, you know, speaking of serving lentil soup to everybody, um, when one of my students gave a talk about this project last year, usually there's pizza at the lunch and I'm like, oh my gosh, we can't serve pizza when we talk about fiber and the microbiome. And so I showed up with an enormous vat of lentil soup and my student was, you know, probably a little embarrassed. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we kind of had this competition about like if the pizza or the lentil soup would get eaten more quickly, but the lentil soup did disappear. And, um, and so that was kind of fun to get to share it with everyone. Um, so here, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about the way that fiber can impact your health um, through the way it can persist through your digestive tract and support the metabolism of the microbes that live in your gut. Um, so when I say microbiome, let me just start from the beginning. Um, by a microbiome, I mean the collections of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other microbes that live in any environment. So microbiomes are not specific to the human body at all. Um, however, especially in the last 10 or 15 years, there's just been a huge increase in research that has helped us to, um, to characterize the different types of microbes living in human bodies under different circumstances. So now we have data supporting that there are microbiomes associated with obesity, cancer, autoimmune diseases, brain chemistry, even vaccine efficacy, which is especially relevant to us right now. So actually a big part of the goal of eating well and eating a lot of fiber to promote your microbiome is actually to promote a healthy immune response to your vaccine. So if I had to have one piece of advice in the time before you get a vaccine, it's to sleep enough and to eat lots of fiber and a diversity of plant fibers, which um, will help promote your vaccine efficacy. So traditionally, um, human and environmental microbiology has been studied separately, but microbes certainly don't distinguish and nothing is sterile. So you might find medical textbooks that describe eyes or lungs as sterile, but we now know that there really are microbes everywhere. Um, and so it's not just the human microbiome um, that really affects our health and our future. Um, there's soil microbiomes, ocean microbiomes, and that's what UCI actually has really great strength in, um, I'd like to, to point out. Um, if you look back 100 years, you'll even see that at that time, the way that medical microbiologists and environmental microbiologists were, were studying their microbial communities was very different. So in the words of a Russian microbial ecologist who developed something called a Winogradsky column, which you can see here, 
he was really thinking about how the microbes in the environment work together. So one microbe's trash becomes the next microbe's treasure in a Winogradsky column. Whereas Robert Koch, whose research expanded human lifespan and had really important public health consequences, of course, he was most concerned with growing microbes just one at a time. And that's still what happens when you go to the clinical micro lab. They'll take a sample and often streak it out and try to get a pure individual microbe described as a pathogen and not really think about the whole community of microbes that's, that's living on your body and potentially impacting the ability of a pathogen to thrive in a particular environment. So now we're in this lucky position where these fields are coming together and now there's a whole group of scientists that are now studying human microbiomes, thinking more like ecologists and looking at the whole community together. So I feel really lucky to be a microbiome scientist in this era. Um, and when I started my lab here at UC Irvine in 2014, um, I just got inundated with requests to collaborate, mostly from the medical school, but actually, as you can see, from all over campus. And so I was lucky to partner with Professor Jennifer Martini, and we started a microbiome initiative. And um, we've had a lot of fun um, spreading microbiome science and study design and thinking um, across all different parts of our campus. And we have a free consulting hour every Thursday at 2 p.m. that you can sign up for on our website if um, that's interesting to you. Um, also, just looking back at how this all got started, um, here's a paper I found fascinating um, back from the 60s, where the gut microbes of people from um, Uganda and the United Kingdom were compared. And even then, they could see that there were big differences in the types of microbes colonizing the guts of people that ate more processed foods, honestly, um, is a big difference, which is why it's relevant for this talk. Um, that the people in Uganda were eating a great diversity of plant fibers. Um, and this was associated with carrying more plant breakdown microbes in their guts. Um, and so in the last half of the 20th century, we've seen a really big change in the incidence of autoimmune and allergic diseases during the same time that a lot of other changes in lifestyle have occurred in the industrialized world. So um, you'll see that many infectious diseases have decreased in incidence through the successes of vaccination and sanitation and other public health campaigns. But during that same time in the second half of the 20th century, there's been a really big increase um, in autoimmune diseases, allergic diseases, even some cancers um, could be considered in the same way. And um, this, this evidence, this exact set of plots are what convinced the National Institutes of Health to fund the Human Microbiome Project um, a little bit more than 10 years ago. And so now we have started to study the types of microbes that are colonizing our bodies and to understand how that is impacting our health. Um, so in the United States, most children before their 18th birthday um, are given about 18 uh, different courses of antibiotics for various reasons. Um, and that is adding up to just big changes in the types of microbes that our bodies are exposed to, especially during important developmental windows um, as we're growing up. And uh, Marty Blazer, he's one of the fathers of the hygiene hypothesis, wrote a really nice book about this that I can recommend where you can learn more about that. Um, also, there's these really interesting efforts now to try to conserve the microbes from around the world that are disappearing. So for example, the Global Microbiome Conservancy is an effort to um, collect and preserve microbes from peoples living all over the world so that we don't just lose these microbes. So right now in the industrialized world, for example, the bacteria that breaks down breast milk, it's a bifidobacteria, is often missing. Most of the time it's missing in babies in the United States and Europe. We don't have great numbers on it. It's not that every baby has this tested, but in the studies that have been done, it's often missing. Um, and so it could be that we could work to improve the incidence of things like atopic dermatitis, which are becoming incredibly common by helping to colonize um, people with the bugs that we know are healthy and will promote healthy immune development. 
Um, so what are our options for manipulating the microbiome? That's especially relevant when we're talking about what to eat. So, um, you know, when I first started my lab, we were really just trying to characterize microbiomes, not to try to change them yet. But now we're starting to understand some of the tools we could use to really manipulate our microbiomes. Um, so options include um, probiotics like live bacteria, things like the bacteria you might find in yogurt, um, prebiotics. So that actually refers to um, molecules that would feed the microbes in your gut, for example. So fiber is an example of a prebiotic. And then, um, especially in the questions, I'd be happy to talk about other big, um, now becoming more common approaches for manipulating the microbiome, including um, gut microbial transplantations like fecal transplants, which are mostly being used to treat Clostridia difficile. And now in the United States, there have been something like 50 or 60,000 of them successfully in the last decade. And another thing that's up and coming and something we actually focus on in my lab is phage therapy. So using viruses that target um, pathogenic bacteria as alternatives to antibiotics. But today we're gonna to focus on prebiotics and food. Um, so that makes me wanna define what is fiber, which is actually kind of hard to define. So if you look for the definition, you'll find people describing it as um, carbohydrate polymers. So chains of carbohydrates um, with many of the little monomer individual units of carbohydrates linked together. And really the key is that our human genome does not really contain tools for breaking down fiber. So when you eat fiber, um, it's, it's gonna persist in your digestive tract until bacterial enzymes that can break down the fiber get to it. There's interesting implications of that. So for example, um, fiber does not immediately turn into glucose and affect your blood sugar. So for people who are diabetic, and actually for all of us who really should be thinking about not dosing ourselves with tons of glucose every time we eat, um, uh, fiber you know, will not cause your blood sugar to spike. And in fact, you can even subtract fiber um, from the carbohydrate count um, when you're dosing insulin as a diabetic. So just to give you some examples, I'm of course gonna show you lentils, but let's start with some white bread and some whole wheat bread. You'll see that the um, total carbohydrates in white bread are mostly coming from simpler carbohydrates than fiber. There's only one gram of, of fiber compared to the total carbohydrates in white bread. It's a little bit better in whole wheat bread. So here you've got four grams out of the total of 19. So if you were dosing insulin, you could count this as 15 grams of carbohydrates. But now let's look at some lentils. <clears throat> lentils are about half fiber, and this is true for most beans and, and um, legumes. So out of the carb count here, half of them are coming from fiber. And so in general, when you eat something like lentils, it will have a much more gentle effect on your blood sugar. The, this is individual as well. Each person's um, physiology, largely dictated by their microbiome actually, um, will have a different um, glycemic response to different foods. Um, but the point here is just that most of the carbohydrates in lentils are in the form of fiber, or at least half. Black beans are similarly very high in fiber. So, um, there's lots of ways to get beans and lentils. And if you're looking to increase the fiber in your diet, this is a really easy way to do it. There's even a clinical trial in Texas right now to increase fiber and avoid the recurrence of colon cancer. And the intervention is Old Navy beans, one cup of Old Navy beans per day. Um, to illustrate this idea that fiber is persisting in your digestive tract, I just want to show you this diagram here going from the duodenum, duodenum down through the colon. I'm showing you the abundance of bacteria in these different compartments. Um, and if you eat things like white rice, they are absorbed more quickly and earlier in your digestive tract. Whereas foods that have high fiber will persist in your digestive tract and last all the way into the colon where most of your bacteria in, are living and they'll give their bacteria something to eat. So in the United States right now, people eat about half of the recommended daily allowance of fiber. 
which is getting them something like 15 grams a day or something like that. And um, that means that your bacteria living in your colon are essentially being starved of the most important nutrients. So eating fiber helps to give them something to eat. So is fiber important? Um, you know, why does this even matter? Um, and I have to say, we were very inspired by this study um, where they, uh, they did a diet swap that I'll describe, where they had people in, in rural South Africa who without even trying eat something like 70 grams of fiber a day. And they had them swap diets with people on the East Coast of the United States who eat a very high fat and protein diet. And they had them swap diets for just two weeks. And in that time, when they studied their microbiomes at the end of the study, they found that the um, people in the United States who swapped and ate the higher fiber diet for two weeks, they had noticeable and significant changes in their microbiomes and also even in um, markers of precancerous uh, uh, colon cancer risk. So um, just in these two weeks, they could already see changes um, associated with health um, that came from eating a higher fiber diet. Another um, important goal you know, uh, in health here is to try to increase the diversity of your gut microbiome. Um, so it, we, see, we see that in other parts of the world where people eat a lot of different types of plants and a larger amount of fiber in their diet, they have a much um, greater diversity of gut microbes. And um, in this citizen science project, um, there were 10,000 people in the project um, and they surveyed how many different types of plants the people were eating in a week. And, um, and they found that the people who were eating more than 30 different types of plants in a week, in general, had a higher diversity um, of their gut microbiome. So I think that's also an interesting challenge is to think about expanding the diversity of the different types of plant fibers that you have in your diet. So um, for this project that we did that I want to describe, um, we were looking to ask the question, how does a wholesome diet high in fiber change the gut microbiome and also influence the abundance of molecules that promote health in the intestine? And so here's, um, here's the, the class we did this with. It was a lab class held on, on our campus at UC Irvine, and it was opt-in. Um, and so we had more than 20 students who were interested in participating. Um, and uh, a graduate student in my lab, Andrew Oliver, was the TA for the class, and he knows how to do all the methods for, for characterizing microbiomes. So it was really fun. He also ended up kind of being a coach in the class, making sure everybody drank enough water and everything. Um, we've written two papers about the project, one more focused on the science and another more focused on the education outcomes that are both available online if you're interested. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so here, let me tell you about it. So the study design was like this. So it was a 10 week quarter and we wanted to get everything done in time to be able to process the samples and have the students get to work with the data. So um, in the first week of the class, we just as a baseline got everybody keeping track of their diets using an app called MyFitnessPal. Um, and we also had them collect three fecal samples um, within a week. It wasn't important that they were on consecutive days. So that gave us some flexibility for being able to collect the samples. Um, so we had three baseline samples at the beginning. And then for the next two weeks, we encouraged everybody to eat first more than 40 grams of fiber per day, and then more than 50 grams of fiber per day. And we had meals from thistle that I'll describe that were high in fiber. The students were given two meals per day to help them achieve this. And then we also had them collect three fecal samples during the, the third week. So here's an example of one of these meals. You know, I went online looking for um, meal prep companies that had high fiber so that the students could, you know, get some help with, with achieving this change in their diet. And, um, and I found that this company Thistle just most of their meals had a lot of fiber and a lot of plant diversity too. And so they actually um, contributed to the study and they gave us a good deal on these meals so that we could provide them. 
Um, and then one of the most fun things about the class was just how interested the students were and how much we all learned about what has a lot of fiber in it. For example, I didn't know that avocados were so high in fiber. I thought of them as being full of healthy fats, but actually they have a lot of fiber in them too. Also beans, as you know, I've already mentioned it, but beans and lentils are just very, very dense with fiber. So if, if the whole country just ate a cup of beans a day, that would actually probably have a real impact on, on health in many ways. Um, and then berries are very, very high in fiber. So that's another quick way to increase your fiber intake. Um, and I guess another thing to say is just that it wasn't easy to increase your fiber. Um, this much, uh, people really did have to make substantial changes in their diets. Um, so first question is, did we actually get students to increase their fiber intake in the context of the study? And actually we really did. So here you can see um, the fiber in each of the weeks I just talked about and people started out on average with less than 20 grams per day and got you know up to where we had hoped above actually um, so that was that was really cool. Just to have a look at the other nutrients, um, you can see that um, fat intake didn't change too much. Carbs went up, but that of course is part of the fiber. Um, and maybe there was a bit of an increase in calories and protein. So people were eating more to get the increase in fiber. Another kind of interesting and unexpected uh, thing that we found is that. Um, so here's the fiber that I just told you about. We, so we did the processing of these fecal samples and we assessed what all the different microbes were and in these samples. And we asked this question about diversity. So was the number of different types of bacteria and also their evenness um, increasing after we did the dietary intervention for two weeks? And actually, if anything, we saw a little bit of a decrease and um, this is something we've thought about a lot, but it was a two week intervention. And the way I'm looking at it is that this is like the beginning of a revolution. And so, um, you know, we, we did the intervention and the new regime of, of bacteria that are good at processing all these fibers was just getting started. So I think a longer intervention would be really interesting so that we could see if we would uh, find an increase in the diversity with more, more time. Um, but the diet intervention did have a significant effect on the gut microbiome. Each person is really individual. So that's the first thing you need to know anytime you study a microbiome. It's actually really important to take longitudinal samples so that you can see um, the change relative to somebody's own starting point because we're all quite individual. But we did see that nearly 10% of the variance in our data set within each person was explained, was changed during the dietary intervention. Um, and some of the bacteria that are associated with the change are shown here. And I'm putting a link to our paper in case you're interested in looking at this in more detail. Um, but bifidobacterium, which I'm, I think might even be a household name, but you'll have to correct me and bring me back to reality here. But bifidobacteria is a bacteria that is good at breaking down um, plant fibers, and it's often seen as a probiotic um, in the health food stores, for better or for worse. Um, and we did actually see that that was one of the ones that was associated with our fiber intervention. Um, Similarly, Prevotella is a bacteria that is known for carrying a lot of these enzymes that can break down plant fibers. That was one of the ones that we saw was associated with the fiber intervention. So we did see some expected changes. There also are bacteria that we typically think of as also carrying these fiber breakdown enzymes, Ruminococcus, for example, which was, which was not associated with the fiber intervention. It was actually in higher abundance before the intervention. So um, again, I think a longer intervention would be really interesting to see if that would give the new fiber um, specializing bacteria time to establish. Um, okay, so that concludes the data from that study, but I just wanna leave you with a few more resources um, to learn about getting high fiber into your life. Um, 
So I'm sharing with you now the um, website of a graduate student who every February cooks a different high fiber meal every day and he posts the, what, the recipes. So that's nice to see just examples of how to, how to pull that off. I know during the pandemic, especially at the beginning, there was just this rush on beans, which is really interesting. So a lot of people have a lot of beans in their pantry right now. Even the New York Times has a bunch of recipes to help you get ideas for what to do with all those beans. And another thing you can do with the beans is you can sprout them. So that's something that I've had fun doing. Um, you can take lentils or beans or any of these and uh, sprout them like in a mason jar, for example. And uh, you can eat the sprouts or you can plant them in your garden and try to see if you can get them to the next generation. Um, and uh, this actually comes from the graduate student who led this project who I mentioned, Andrew Oliver, um, and uh, just the pointing out that um, there's this possibility that we could uh, rewild our microbiomes and um, promote a diversity of, of microbes, for example, by eating a diversity of plants. So some of my take home messages um, are that we think that fiber could play an important role in maintaining gut health. Um, and you need both the microbes and the fiber. So um, because of this loss of, of different types of microbes in the industrialized world, just eating the fiber might not be enough to promote a, a new healthy microbiome. And so I think that's something that we will learn a lot more about in the next 10 years, um, figuring out if there are ways that we can supplement um, with healthy microbes and also with fibers that promote them. Um, the current probiotics that are on the market are not always optimized for, even for living in the human gut, they might be optimized for living in yogurt, for example. So that's an area that I expect to really expand in the next few years. Um, and then something that, um, I think is likely to be a good idea is to aim to increase the diversity of plants and even fermentation products like eating fermented foods that have a lot of interesting microbial breakdown products in them um, could be important for promoting health. Okay, so with that, I would like to acknowledge um, first my lab in person. Now that's more than a year ago at our last lab lunch. Um, now our lab meetings look like this on Zoom. And then um, I would also like to acknowledge everybody who was so important to making this study happen. And I've put a few questions and the opportunity to volunteer as a healthy donor um, for microbiome research here as well. So thank you. And I can see there's a bunch of questions, which is great. Yeah, so there's a lot of questions here. So I wonder whether um, you should answer some of these while people still have all these terms in their head. Yeah, so that sounds great. Back to the last demo and then some more questions, because I think these questions are really great and uh, be nice to get some answers now. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And then I just want to ask Jess if she needs to say anything before I keep talking, because looks like the soup is going great. Why don't you stop sharing screen and then we can yes. see you uh, a little bit bigger and you can see these questions. So I'm going to let you, um, I think I'll just let you select the questions because you yeah. know what's of scientific interest and practical interest. Absolutely. Sounds good. All right. So I am looking at um, the questions. So um, I hear uh, from Mac McCoy. Hi, Mac. I know, <laughs> hi, Mac. Um, I know mushrooms aren't plants, but... Um, would they count towards the 30 plants in a week? I think absolutely. I mean, the goal here is to increase the molecular diversity of your diet in order to give your microbes an interesting set of micro of molecules to munch on and micro uh, mushrooms would certainly accomplish that. So yes, I definitely think that would be reasonable. Um, soluble fiber versus insoluble fiber. What about all these highly processed added fibers that you find? I mean, wow, that is a great question. That is a science question. Um, to be honest, that was one of the goals of our study. So in our intervention, we used food. Um, there have been other really great studies. For example, at the University of Michigan, they have this huge bio class where they have the students take 
um, fiber supplements and they similarly look at the microbiome before and after. So they'll use like resistant potato starch or psyllium husks and other added fibers like that. And it does, I mean, I do think it can have a positive impact on the microbiome. I don't think there's a way for me to answer that question about like whether it's good or bad. I mean, all of these questions about what is healthy in the microbiome are still research questions that we don't really have a solid answer to right now. In my mind, it's better to get the fiber from food. It's better to have a diversity of fiber. But if it was, you know, well, either I'm going to add some psyllium husks every day or I'm just going to like live on white bread, I would say the psyllium husks are going to be an improvement. So if it is a way that would make you get more fiber into your diet, I could see it being really positive. Um, I've even seen these great studies of psyllium husks replacing medicines that are otherwise used in the context of heart disease. You know, would, I think it would be much better to have teenagers taking psyllium husks than starting on a lifelong cardiac medicine young early in their life. And so I feel really optimistic about the potential for using even the more boring single supplements um, as alternatives to pharmaceuticals to, to help in health. So um, let's see. So yeah, so I'm getting a lot of the questions about the fiber supplements. What is my view on fiber supplements? Um, I went on a diet that was low in fiber, so I had to take fiber supplements. Um, you know, is there a huge difference? I mean, there, I don't think I have evidence from the scientific literature to answer that question, to be honest. There are studies where people use supplements. There's other studies where people use whole diet. Sometimes there's comparisons. Nutrition studies are really um, hard to do in large enough numbers to really get a conclusive answer. Um, but so I know that's a bit unsatisfying, but I think as much as possible, it's better to get a diversity of fibers from actual whole foods, but given this a circumstance where it's psyllium husks or nothing, I would imagine that you would be much better off getting some fiber from a supplement um, and just aiming for diversity as much as possible. Um, so, so here's a question. So is eating fiber kind of like exercising your microbiome? Um, whereas if you don't eat it, it becomes sedentary. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's a good way to put it. I mean, it's, it's just, if you eat fiber, then the microbes that live in your colon get their favorite food and they'll, they'll starve otherwise. So actually one of the signatures of industrialized countries is that people in industrialized countries have a lot more microbes that break down mucus in their colon. So it suggests that there was no plant fiber to eat. And so the microbes just turn to the mucus lining your gut. Um, some of those microbes have even been considered to be healthy. So it's, it's still, it's not that it's the end of the world. I mean, we're still learning about the implications, but, um, but yeah, if you don't eat fiber, then, um, then your microbes have to find something else to eat. And that actually ends up sometimes being the mucus lining our colon. Um, does freezing destroy or mostly destroy fiber? That's a good question. Um, no, I mean, maybe a little, maybe there's some breakdown through, through freeze thaw cycles or, you know, in my mind, I used to think of cooking as breaking down sugars and making them simpler, but actually that's not always the case. In fact, um, in that study in South Africa, I was just telling you about, I learned how they did it. And apparently one of the really common foods was a corn mush that they get a big pot going in the morning. And every time a kid wants a snack, they heat it back up. And apparently the fiber content actually increases through the day. So by the end of the day, all that cooling and heating actually increases the complexity of the fibers. And um, I can think of a few examples that I think we could all relate to. Maybe Jess could comment on this. Like for example, if you put mashed potatoes in the freezer and then you take them back out, sometimes they get to have this kind of bizarre texture that's set like there's a big clumpy part that separates from the liquid. And apparently that also is the formation of increased complexity fibers. Um, so, so the biggest, the big picture answer though, is like, if you make lentil soup and put it in the freezer and then you eat it, you will still get tons of fiber. So I think freezing is fine for fiber. Fiber is hearty stuff. That's the point. Um, ooh, we've got a question from Harry Mangalin. 
um, hi, Harry, uh, does a diet um, in simple carbohydrates, a fiber poor diet, change the microbiome such that subsequent meals of fiber is poorly digested? I really love that question. And it's, it's not something, so part of your question is, how quickly does your microbiome change to the point that you would no longer have the capacity to do a really important function like breaking down fiber? Um, one of my favorite studies that addresses that actually followed mice over three generations to watch that happening. So, um, so I don't think that would happen um, you know, necessarily even in one lifetime, but we now have had a century of industrialization and eating a lot of simple foods. So for example, a person today eats as much sugar in one day as a person ate in one year, 300 years ago. So now we've been doing this experiment in humanity and a group at Stanford, the Sonnenbergs, they recently did that experiment in mice, which was really interesting. And they got a bunch of mice, and they inoculated them with gut bacteria from one 30-year-old male. And, you know, it's probably the postdoc leading the project. <laughs> and, uh, and then they, the first generation got fiber. Sorry, in the first generation, they stopped giving the mice fiber. And then they followed them for three generations. And then at the third generation, they tried giving them fiber to see if um, the mice still had the capacity to break down fiber because now there had been two generations where the, the parents were not eating fiber so they wouldn't pass that function to their kids. And by the third generation, the capacity for breaking down fiber was much, much diminished. And so that's that's what's happening right now, I would say, um, in the in the Western world. So if you compare microbiomes from people in other parts of the world where they still eat a lot of fiber, there's just much greater capacity for breaking down plant fibers. Um, so we should probably turn to Jessica and then return to the questions so that we make sure we get the full demo. Oh my gosh, good point. And thank you, yeah. Katrina. This is so fascinating. I did want to point out though, there was a slide that Katrina shared that had a brand of beans. And I always like giving them props. And I think it's the best bean brand out there. It's called Gordo Beans. If you are a person who does not like beans, try Gordo Beans. Um, they will change your life. Um, they're creamy. They cook well. And if you're afraid of cooking beans, use an Instant Pot. Instant Pots are amazing at making beans and it makes life that much easier. There are also a lot of beans that actually don't require soaking. So black beans, you can, you can get away with just boiling them. But if you need to quick soak them, so if you felt like you needed to make beans and you didn't have time to soak them, you can do a quick soak. And so a quick soak is bring a pot of water to boil and then put your beans in there and let them soak for an hour and then take it on from there. But here's a big tip that I can give you. Soaked beans can be frozen. So soak your beans and then freeze them if you want to, and then just cook them like you would for whatever it is that you need. So I'm going to show you a, oh, before we get started, let's check on that soup. The soup looks amazing. It's done. And I just want to show you what I do. Uh, the recipe calls for, all right. So there's the chunks. It's nice and thick. Anthony, who, Anthony is here helping us film right now. And his comment was, how does that get so thick? This is the beauty of lentils. You get such a rich, creamy consistency out of such a basic ingredient. And so you can just think of the millions of things you can make and use this as your creamy component. It's the same with navy beans or can, um, white beans. They blend really well and they can make things really nice and creamy. So I'm using a uh, handheld immersion. And you can make this as smooth or as chunky as you want. And then season it with a little bit of salt and pepper. I'll tell you, a squeeze of lemon juice on this brings it over the top too. So if you want, you could do that. And then you've got soup. And then like I said, freeze it if you're not gonna have it and freeze it flat and just stick it in your freezer and then pull them out 
as you want. And they'll last about three months in your freezer. So let's make some energy balls or energy bites. Oats, um, rolled oats is what I'm using. If you have quick oats, that's fine too. You can use quick oats. A tip though, if you are somebody who likes to cook a lot and you want a new trick with oats, start toasting them. You can toast your oats on the stove or in an oven and just toast them so they're brown. It just makes them a little bit heartier and the, they have more flavor to them. And so I like doing that. And then we have flaxseed meal. Flaxseed meal store, if you buy it, store it in your refrigerator, first of all. I find if you buy them whole in the seeds, it's perfectly fine if you have a coffee grinder and just grind it as you need it. So this is the meal, flaxseed meal that you can use. And then we need a sugar component of some kind. So the three sugars that, um, liquid sugars that we'll often tell people in culinary medicine to use are honey, agave, or maple. Out of those three though, the one that we suggest the most is maple, just because of the um, anti-inflammatory benefits that it has. Agave and honey, you wanna be careful because they do tend to still be really sweet. So don't add too much if you, don't add too much if you don't need it, but you do need most of it to bind it together. But there is one last ingredient. There were or two or three, peanut butter. So I wanted to show you. A lot of people don't do this. When you buy peanut butter, the kind that only has peanut, you should store it upside down. The oil will get to the bottom and it'll be easier to store then. I mean, easier to stir. So store it upside down. When you're ready to use it, flip it over and it should be nice and creamy at that point. Um, peanut butter like this is so nice to buy, but people don't store it correctly and then they choose not to use it. I'm doubling the recipe so it might look like I'm making a lot. Because this also freezes well and kids love it because the next part that you're gonna add is where you can make it a little bit more fun for them, right? So I'm gonna mix all of these ingredients together. And then I have chocolate chips and coconut, unsweetened coconut. So that little bit of chocolate chip makes it a little bit more kid friendly for me, for my kids, but you don't have to add it. You can add nuts, dried fruit um, is great. Raisins, craisins, all those good things. Tip on raisins, buy them organic if possible. Um, the Dirty Dozen list came out recently of like the produce that you should be buying organic because of pesticide use. And the one, in, the one thing that they can never put on there because it's not an actual fruit are raisins. But grapes are usually heavily sprayed. And so you want to be careful when you buy raisins because they really have a lot of stuff on them. All right. So I'm going to keep mixing just like that. Now, you can make these into bars or I like making them into little like almost bites. So you just go in and form little balls just like that. Put them on a cookie sheet and then freeze them. Or you can make them into a bar, fill this whole tray up and then just cut it. They really don't get super duper hard. So don't be afraid to freeze them. Um, and they, the amount of flaxseed in here might seem like a lot, but it's really good. It doesn't, it doesn't taste like flaxseed. The other tip that I'll give you with flaxseed, if you're interested, because it just seems like they sell such a large bag of flaxseed sometimes, flaxseed or meal, you might not use all of it. What you can do is start making flaxseed eggs. So if you have a recipe that's uh, like a cookie recipe or a cake recipe that calls for two or more eggs, try, I'm not guaranteeing that it'll work, but you can try substituting one of those eggs with a flaxseed egg. And a flaxseed egg is one tablespoon of flaxseed meal mixed with three tablespoons of water. And if you let that sit 
for a little bit, you'll notice it kind of looks gooey. You used the word mucus earlier, Katrina, so I'm going to use the word mucus. It looks mucusy. <laughs> that is the best way to use, say that too. And so you can use that in any, uh, you can try. Sorry, I can't say you can for sure, but most of the time it works. And then you're getting that extra fiber into a baked good that you would normally not be adding it to. So um, it's it's been a fun little addition that we do at home, definitely. So if anyone has any questions for this, I'll take them, but if not, I know a lot, there's a lot more questions out there for you. Great, I saw Ross Flesh, Fleshman just raised her hand. Ooh. Um, but I'm, I'm answering questions in the chat. Um, oh, good. I've been getting a lot of questions, a great question about, you know, we know that there's personalized nutrition and personalized medicine. Can I recommend doing some kind of screening to assess for yourself um, food sensitivities or um, ways that you could optimize your own diet to promote microbiome health? I mean, I do think that's the future, but right now the kinds of things we can do are we can count the microbes in your gut. We can correlate that with how your blood sugar changes when you eat. Um, but these are all correlations at this point. So I think we're still a few years away from honestly being able to do that. Although there are companies claiming that they can do that. So day two is an Israeli company that they published a big study in cell about five years ago where they got a thousand people. They gave them all continuous glucose monitors and then they gave them different food and they looked to see the individualized glycemic. So how does your blood sugar change after you eat? They looked at the individualized glycemic responses of all these people um, and they studied their microbiomes. And then they went and correlated everything. And they're like, oh, this guy, his blood sugar spikes when he eats bananas and he's got a bunch of this one kind of bacteria or like this other person, they spike when they eat tomatoes and it was very individualized. So all those charts of glycemic index from hundred years ago or 50 years ago, were made without thinking about people as being so unique. Um, and so I do think there's a lot to that and that someday we'll get there. But right now, um, I think that the my personal opinion is that those companies are overstating their ability to um, give you good dietary advice um, based on a smaller number of people. But if you sign up for day two and you give them your sample, you're contributing to that effort because they'll study your microbiome and you can participate in those trials um, and wear a continued glu glucose monitor yourself. And, um, and so then you can contribute to that effort. I think in five or 10 years, it, that could be possible. Um, There's a question I keep going here with about the, the immersion blender oh, cool. and whether it shreds the insoluble fiber and therefore remove some of the benefits. This is from Lisa. I, I don't think that that's an issue. Um, the, the way that, you know, the size of the molecules, um, you know, the, the structures that we're talking about are not um, something that would easily be destroyed by an immersion blender. I think you would still get lots of fiber into your colon. And there's a question here about vinegar and lemon and lime juice from Diana. Um, that she feels that it helps keep the gut happy. Does the vinegar affect these, you know, these acidic flavor enhancers affect gut biomes? I mean, that's a wonderful question, and I don't have um, evidence to answer your question with. I can say that pH, so acid, actually has a huge impact on a lot of bacteria. It's very fundamental. It's like one of the really fundamental things that will change um, bacterial physiology. But it's actually quite complicated to answer that question in diet because you know you eat the you eat something with um, a lot of acid and it goes through your stomach, which is already full of acid. So um, how that affects what's going on in your colon, I think is actually a pretty complicated question. Um, but overall, I think it would add to your diversity in your diet. And I think that lemons and I personally consider lemons and vinegar to be healthy, so. Great, here's a question that's more for Jess. Um, 
about using fake peanut butter due to allergies. How would you adjust that recipe if you were not using actual peanut butter? Sunflower butter is one of the great ones that I like. Um, if you've never baked with sunflower butter, it's really cool too, because it changes the color of your baked goods. So sunflower butter is a good one, almond butter. Um, so any of the nut butters would work well for something like this, but you do need something like that in order to bind it all together. Great, and Mike Clark has a question about, about phage therapy, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Phage, phage? Oh, phage, yes. Do you wanna just tell us a little bit more about what that is? And sure. how UCI is leading the race? <laughs> Um, so, okay, well, so the question is just what is phage therapy? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, do you have more information about it? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, so phages um, were being used against bacteria even before we had antibiotics. So in the former Soviet republics and also in the United States and Europe, um, just around the time that antibiotics were first emerging, um, we discovered phages a little bit before that. And so there are parts of the world in the former Soviet republics, especially where phages have been used for um, antibacterial therapy for a century. And phages are viruses that kill bacteria. Wow. Um, and so um, in my lab, um, well, actually I did a postdoc in San Diego before I started my lab. Um, where I got to study phages, the whole communities of phages, like all the phages that are in a sample. I mean, for every living cell, there's gonna be a bunch of viruses that infect it. So my old boss in San Diego, Forest Rower, he would always joke that um, cells exist so that viruses would have something to eat. You know, and bacteria are no exception. So for all of those thousands of gut bacteria that we're all feeling like our minds are boggled by the numbers, there's an order of magnitude more viruses. So anytime you have an infection with a bacteria, you should be able to find viruses that will kill that bacteria and using different strategies than what an antibiotic would do. So now I'm sometimes getting to participate. There are two leading centers in the United States using phages only under compassionate use exemption circumstances. This has not been approved in clinical trials yet, um, but there's um, two centers in San Diego and Yale and a few other parts of the country, actually Baylor in uh, Texas is also leading this, where sometimes a patient will have an intractable infection. And so then we hear this stuff on social media, like, hey, does anybody have a phage that'll infect this kind of bug? And, um, and sometimes our lab does. So that's one way that we've participated. Um, we have, before the pandemic, I was getting a sewage sample from the Orange County Sanitation District every two weeks. And then I had a team of students that were constantly hunting for phages. We have a few bacteria in particular that we always work with. Um, some of them are like these escape pathogens, the ones that are very resistant to antibiotics. And, um, and so now we have a little bit of a library of these phages that can infect different types of bacteria. And, um, and so we're studying them. And then we also sometimes can send them to the clinic if there's a patient who has an infection like that. There was a really famous case in San Diego a couple of years ago, a professor there got a really horrible Acinetobacter infection. And his wife, who was a public health professor, learned about phage therapy as an undergrad. And she asked the doctor like, hey, could we try this? And she was in, San Diego's full of phage biologists. And so she asked the right people because they loved that question and they went after it. And so a bunch of labs got together and helped um, get the right phages. And this guy was treated with them and he survived. And this, the story is being made into a movie. Um, so that's, that's a really cool story. And uh, yeah, there's a book about it. I could even show you guys. Um, it's called The Perfect Predator. Um, and so anyhow, I work really closely with, with the group in San Diego and a little bit with Yale too. Wow, amazing. Um, Monica has a question about taking prebiotics and probiotics before or while taking antibiotics. Well, that is a really, really good question. Um, and again, it's a research question. I don't have like huge studies to answer that question with, with evidence, um, but I would say, Prebiotics are a really good idea because then you're going to keep the material going in your colon that will promote the growth of healthy bacteria. Probiotics, I have um, 
some evidence to suggest that it's a bad idea. So for example, there was a group in Israel who recently did a study where they had people taking antibiotics get probiotics afterwards. And they actually found that the healthy or the, the initial gut bacterial community that was there before the antibiotics was slower to return. So the probiotics were kind of occupying the niche space that you would expect the healthy bacteria to normally um, be able to grow in. Now, is that good or bad? That's a really hard question to answer. I would much rather have some yogurt lactobacillus growing in my gut than get like a C. diff infection or a salmonella infection. So maybe having that probiotic hold that space would be protective, but it also would mean that your normal gut bugs would be slower to return. So I actually have been writing grants to study that question. Um, because I think that's a really important question. And at the Children's Hospital in Orange County, the doctors there actually prescribe probiotics after children get antibiotics in, in the surgical ward. Um, and they're doing it with the hope that it will help, but there isn't really great evidence to show whether it would or not. Um, I think prebiotics are um, certainly not going to hurt. I think they're much less likely to be able to hurt and very likely to help. So personally, I think prebiotics are a better idea. But I think being able to manage our microbiomes in these tough circumstances of like being given antibiotics or like if you're in the ICU and you're getting all these different medications and then your diet is just like sugary jello, that feels like the worst thing you could do. Um, so I really think there's room to improve diet in the context of hospitalization and antibiotics and to be able to re reduce hospital um, associated infection by just protecting people. So it's, it's often the case that the most dominant gut bug, and when you take antibiotics, you get this weird stuff growing in your gut. And it's very often the case that a septic infection is caused by the most dominant bug in that person's gut in the hospital. So that feels like something we could also improve. Well, we're running out of time, and I thought maybe that's a good segue for Jessica to say something about the culinary medicine program that she helps teach with the medical school, the yeah. intention of which, as I understand, is really to educate the next generation of doctors about the role of diet and research on diet in medical care and wellness. Jess, you want to tell us a little bit about the important work that you're doing? Yeah, so right now um, we're on, I believe, our third or fourth year of medical school students. And so we teach MS1s and MS2s. And if they're in the integrative health track, it's a mandatory course now. So they have to take this. And my goal is that I need to teach these future doctors to teach their patients how to cook. And so if I can show these doctors how easy it is to cook or how important it is to cook um, your own meals, they can pass that down to their patients. So when we do these classes, it's amazing because we have an RD, an MD, and then me or a, reg a chef, and we all kind of get together and we put all our minds together to come up with ideas that we feel like our future doctors could pass on. And it's not saying that we should completely eliminate drugs. It's never that. But how can we help benefit the uh, people who might just need a little bit more advice on nutrition. So it's really interesting. Um, we started this year our first group of GI fellows. And so we have a group of GI fellows that we're working with and we've developed a course for them. And we're hopefully gonna be expanding this into different, um, different specialties. So each specialty will have a culinary medicine course designed for them based on whatever it is their practices. Um, and Katrina has, Katrina's work fits so well with this. And so whenever I bring up that I'm doing something with her, they always want to see, they always want to ask questions. And so she's been invited to a few of our events too. Um, she has so much knowledge and it's just so interesting what she's researched on and it just very, very informative stuff. So the culinary medicine side of things, we're expanding, we're building. And if you'd like more information, email us um, and, or email me, sorry. And I can give you a little bit more info on it. But thank well, you. Wow. Yeah. Well, this was just a fantastic evening. I want to thank Katrina Whiteson and Jessica Van Roo for sharing your time, your knowledge, your skills, your vision, your great personalities, your great tech skills, great PowerPoint, 
all of it. And also our great audience. We had more questions than we could answer, really informed and interesting questions reflecting you know, the knowledge orientation of our UCI community. So thank everyone, all of you for, for spending your pre-dinner hour with us. And I hope that we're all gonna go and cook some great lentil soup. And some people were actually cooking during this session as well. And they're I'm sure ready to eat if they haven't already started. <laughs> so thank you so much.